hi friends so in this video what i'm going to do is to discuss management of chest pain and how you should approach it on the us mle exam on your u world and those of you um, who are doing u world this video is a very important video that you should watch so you can get all your questions correct and also your shelf assessments and your cbs uh, exams also it's also important for step one as well um so if you haven't watched the previous video in the previous video we talked about antiarrhythmic drugs where i discuss how they affect the action potential and i discuss um how to understand all the antiarrhythmic drugs so and all their classes so you, sh you can uh, watch those that video as well um so in this video let's begin with the chest pain um how do we manage chest pain so assuming that a patient in you are in the ER as a doctor or you've been called to the floor that a patient is complaining of chest pain and first of all and um, what how to approach chest pain and um, you have to assess the patient first of all and then you call for help whilst that help is on the way coming you check the vital signs of the patient you offer oxygen if needed and you offer nitroglycerin now we have to ask ourselves is this chest pain coming from the heart or is coming from just any part of the chest like the lungs or from um, the, the the bones on the chest the ribs so uh, what we um, do is that we classify this chest pain into a typical atypical and a non-angina pain so um, first of all these are the characteristics of um, a, a typical chest pain we assign a score of one to each of them so the chest pain should be substernal it should be under the sternum and precipitated by by stress or exertion and it should be relieved by rest or nitroglycerin so after we give this nitroglycerin and then we've given oxygen the patient is resting in the bed now we'll ask us what is the score is this did this patient get all these three so that makes it typical chest pain if he gets two over three it's atypical and if it's zero or one over three then it is a non-angina pain so we have to find um, other causes of chest pain for example if i palpate the chest and if i palpate the wall of the chest around the sternum or on the ribs and the patient feels the pain then that means that it is a costochondriasis and it's not it's not a typical chest pain also if the patient breathes in and out and then like he feels the pain it means that probably it's a pleuritic chest pain so let's take note of that now chest pain can be classified into these four but we'll take time and look at each of them separately hmm. so we have a stable angina whereby the patient's pain is relieved at rest or when they stop the exertion then we also have unstable angina whereby the chest pain persists when they are even at rest next is um, put unstable angina and then if you do ekg and unstable angina plus ekg showing st elevation that means that it is a STEMI, um, which is st elevation mi so once you see ekg changes it's likely an mi if you also have an unstable chest pain with increased troponin but no elevation in in the ST segment, then it is a non STEMI. So once you see EKG changes and elevated troponin, that tells you that it is a STEMI. So now let's look at how a typical angina uh, uh, management is done. So if the patient complains of chest pain, the best initial step to do is to obtain an EKG. Next, we do cardiac enzymes. EKG first because EKG changes are immediate, but cardiac enzymes take some time to rise. And bear in mind that once you see cardiac enzymes, it means that the myocytes are injured and then their membrane is damaged and then these enzymes are leaking out of the cardiac myocytes and then they are going into the blood. That's how come we detected. So now your EKG is back and you've seen if there is ST depression, or ST inversion or T wave inversion and cardiac enzymes are normal that means that it is just an ischemia which is an angina so bear in mind if you don't see troponin high and you don't see ST elevation it is just an angina chest pain but now we have to ask ourselves 
what type of angina is there? Is it a stable angina or is it an unstable angina? So that is when we put the patient to rest. So when we rested the patient and then we give the nitroglycerin, did the pain go away? If, it, if the pain went away, then it is a stable angina. The next thing we have to do is to do a stress test. And in the next page, we are going to see how to do a stress test and interpret it. So um, stay put. Second, after we do our EKG and this patient is at rest, we ask ourselves, did this, the pain go away with, with rest or not? So uh, did, uh, did the pain go away with nitrates or not? If it not, if, if it did not, then it means that it persists. So a persistent pain at rest and less responsive to nitrate is um, with no cardiac enzyme elevation, no um, T wave eleva uh, ST elevation. Um, that means that it is uh, uh, an unstable angina. Next is to admit this patient and monitor them closely. And we'll also do the TMI risk score um, to manage the patient. So let's see how we manage a stable angina with stress test. So with these patients, and we take them onto um, like we we do two types of stress tests for them. It could either be exercise stress test or pharmacologic stress test. So what we are doing here is that we want to induce ischemia to the heart to see if ischemia the patient is at risk of MI or not. So when they are doing exercise, like we are now inducing the stress that was uh, aggravating the patient's chest pain, we, we, we place EKG electrodes on the chest whilst they are running on a treadmill or they are running on uh, they are riding a bicycle. So it's either so we have the exercise stress test and the pharmacologic. Under the exercise, we have two types. We have the treadmill, which they can use; those who can run on it, and we also have the bicycle, depending on uh, the patient's condition. And as I said. We place the we place EKG electrodes on their chest and then we monitor them whilst they are running. We are checking the EKG changes. Now, if for some reason we think that EKG um, will, will will not appear normal, for example, the patient has had a massive MI in the past, or the patient has some abnormal EKG that are likely to mask our current EKG changes that we are looking for then we will not use the EKG, but we can use, we can use echo. Uh, we would use um, trans, trans thoracic echo, or we can use, um, they can also use the esophageal one, and then they will see the patient's um, heart and see how the walls are moving during the exercise. We can also use the nuclear perfusion um, study to see, or, um, to see how um, the, the, the heart is get, uh, getting getting blood during the exercise so that will give us an idea about what is happening when the patient is under stress during the exercise <coughs> next is a pharmacologic stress test it's also almost the same just that this time we are using drugs to uh, induce the stress on the myocardium and um, so they for, for this patient for, for some reason they cannot exercise um, for example the patient has a limb amputation they cannot exercise <coughs> the patient is seriously sick they cannot exercise so <coughs> so we can do pharmacologic for them and for this also when we give the pharmacologic drugs we we put an ekg electrode on their chest and then we check their ekg or we can do echo or we can do nuclear perfusion study for them depending on the patient's uh, condition or the doctor's uh, choice or his assessment now these are the drugs that we use to do the exercise stress test Adenosine, dipyridamol, uh, dobutamide, and iso, um, isoproterenol. And the mnemonic for them is DADI. DADI is the mnemonic for the drugs for, for, exercise, um, for pharmacologic stress test. And remember, adenosine and dipyridamol typically cause myocardial still syndrome. That is the mechanism behind this pharmacologic stress test so remember that very very high yield very high yield uh, still syndrome now how do we interpret this exercise stress test and pharmacologic stress test so as 
we induce ischemia or uh, we put the patients on, on stress uh, during the ex uh, bicycle or treadmill, we look at the EKG changes and we ask ourselves, is there an ST elevation? If there's an ST elevation, then this patient, um, the, the test is positive and that shows that the patient has risk of MI in the future. So we have to do something about it. If echo will show us abnormal wall motion, which is a problem, and a nuclear perfusion scan, if it's positive, will show us a decreased uptake of nuclear isotopes. So this is how they describe the result. Now let's look at the first line treatment for um, stable and unstable angina. So for stable angina, when they come, we give them nitrates, aspirin, and beta blockers, and the mnemonic is NAB. For unstable angina, the mnemonic is monoxy batch, monoxy batch, morphine, oxygen, nitrates, aspirin, clopidogrel, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors or ARB, statins, and heparin. Now let's look at, now we've seen chest, uh, angina chest pain. Let's look at chest pain due to MI, myocardial infarction. In this case, we said the patient will present with chest pain with abnormal EKG, but one important thing is that there'll be elevated troponin or CKMB. So troponin or CKMB. Mind you that troponin is the first to, to rise, but it is it rises early but disappears later but ckmb rises later on but disappears first so troponin is what we use to diagnose a um, mi but we use ckmb to monitor whether the patient is having a re ischemia or a, um, a repeat mi so bear in mind now mi can be classified into two Either there is an ST elevation in the MI or there is no ST elevation. So remember, in order to diagnose MI, we don't, we don't necessarily need the ST elevation. We need the troponin and the CKMB. Now, there could be an ST elevation or there could be no ST elevation. Let's look at the non-ST elevation MI first. So this um, one just looks like unstable angina except for elevated troponin and uh, CKMB. There is no ST elevation in non ST in N STEMI, but um, they have ST depression and they have T wave inversion and non specific T wave changes. These are all signs of ischemia. ST depression, T wave inversion, and non specific changes are signs of ischemia, but these are not ST elevation. So take note of the ST elevation. How do we manage these patients? We manage them just like we would manage someone with an unstable um, angina. And we use the Timmy score as well. We use heparin. But if this chest pain is refractory, so it's refractory to medications, and there is elevated troponin, or there is greater than one millimeter ST elevation, then we will have to give this patient um, GP2B3A inhibitors like abcizumab or eptifibatide and schedule the patient for a percutaneous coronary intervention or cabbage, depending on the doctor's assessment. We also put them on dual antiplatelets post the percutaneous coronary intervention to prevent re-stenosis. Add routine medications like statins and also do um, lifestyle modification. So if the patient has hypertension, we have to manage the hypertension. If the patient is a smoker, we have to educate them about smoking and so on. Let's look at STEMI. So STEMI here, as the name suggests, ST elevation MI. So here they have all the signs of myocardial infarction. They have ST segment elevated and they also have elevated cardiac enzymes. Other changes are hyperacute T wave we, have, uh, we also can also get a new left bundle branch block, ST depression, uh, dominant R waves in lead V1 and uh, V2. So if we get ST depression and dominant R waves in lead V1 and V2, it shows that um, there is a posterior wall MI, but it is only showing in the precordial leads. 
So V1 and V2 are part of the precordial leads, but here, because the MI is at the posterior wall of the heart, it's going to flip over. So that's why it's going to show us ST depression in the precordial leads, which should have been um, uh, normally, if that shows in the precordial, it should have been, it should have been an ischemia, but this time, because it's in the posterior wall, it will, it will flip over. Management is uh, admit this patient and do serial troponin like every four hours troponin. We also do CKMB, um, which is an indicator for uh, repeat MI. Avoid beta blockers in such patients um, if they develop heart failure or shock. Um, also, avoid ACE inhibitors um, we, uh, if they have hypotension, but we can give ACE inhibitors, but if they are hypotensive, do not give it. Avoid nitrates and diuretics if they have an inferior wall MI. Very important, very high yield because inferior wall MIs are due to right coronary artery um, occlusion or right ventricular infarction and these are preload dependent. So you don't want to reduce the preload with nitrates or um, diuretics. Other interventions that we do for them is um, for here, since the heart, is, the heart muscles are really necrosed and they are dying, we do emergency uh, angiography and percutaneous coronary intervention if possible. If PCI not possible in less than two hours, we can do uh, thrombolysis if there is no contraindication to that like, um, like previous sub subarachnoid hemorrhage. Let's look at other arrhythmias, how to, me me measure, um, how to manage some of the arrhythmias. So we have AFib. Now, if a patient presents with AFib, we want to ask ourselves, are they stable or they are not, not, not stable? Like, are they hemodynamically stable or they are not? If they are hemodynamically unstable, for example, if they have chest pain, they have AFib with chest pain, hypotension, or with confusion, it means they are hemodynamically unstable, we have to do immediate synchronized cardioversion. Immediate. So imagine your heart is this way, right? And we have the atrium up here, and then we have the ventricles down here. So we have the atrium is fibrillating. So as soon as we see this, we have to do immediate synchronized cardioversion at the top there. So put immediate synchronized cardioversion at the top. Now, if these patients are stable, then we are not worried too much. So what we have to do is we do rate control or rhythm control or both so with rate control we use beta blockers like uh, bisoprolol and metoprolol uh, and yeah we can also use um, calcium um, channel blockers for uh, rate control like uh, diltiazem diltiazem and um, verapamil is also used mostly they use the diltiazem so remember that uh, we can also do a uh, rate control, uh, sorry, we can also do rhythm control using amiodarone and sotalol, uh, flecainide, and propafenone. The mnemonic for that is FAPS. FAPS. Um, so remember that. So what I remember is I, I write the heart, and then since the ventricles are below and U is close to V, UV, so unsynchronized for, um, for, um, <coughs> so unsynchronized for. Uh, ventricular fibrillation and pulseless VTAC. So remember that. So if the patient has ventricular fibrillation and pulseless VTAC, we do unsynchronized cardioversion. If they have AFib with hemodynamic instability, you do synchronized cardioversion. So remember that. Okay, let's do the last slide. So other arrhythmias are here. Um, so use it, let's look at some of the uses of the drugs. These are very high yield in your U world and in your um, yourself. So adenosine, we use adenosine for SVT, and the most important cause of SVT is AVNRT. So if your patient presents with SVT with, or AVNRT, uh, you want to use adenosine for that. And remember, adenosine causes transient uh, skin flash. Uh, they can become very red at once, but it goes quickly because adenosine have a, has a very short half-life. So you have to inform the patient about that before uh, you give it. Also, if the patient presents with bradyarrhythmias, bradycardia, or they come with bradycardia with AV block, we can give them, uh, if they have AV block and their heart rate is below 
um, let's say 60 and maybe they have heart rate of 56 you are going to give them adenosine and adenosine uh, sorry you are going to give them atropine i'm sorry about that you are going to give them atropine and remember the t this t in atropine is a plus sign so it's adding to the heart rate to increase it above uh, uh, six, uh, 60. Next is AFib with rapid ventricular response. So for example, a patient has an AFib, right? And then, and then you measure the heart rate and the heart rate is, um, if the heart rate is around maybe 150, then you will know that the AFib defibrillation that is going on in the atrium it's transmitting into the ventricles that's why the ventricles are giving us a heart rate of 150 ideally the ventricles should slow the fibrillation um, action potential and only pick some of it but now the ventricles are responding that's why they call it afib with rapid ventricular response so that is afib with high or tachycardia let's put it that way afib with tachycardia and what we give them is uh, digoxin digoxin is able to um, uh, delay the AV nodal conduction or it increases the parasympathetic tone on the AV node. So remember this point and thank you for watching this video. Um, if you like this video, just put some comments down there for me and let me know um, also if you have um, some contributions to make to this video. Uh, thank you for um, watching and I wish you good luck. Kindly subscribe also and share the link with your friends so they can also benefit from this. Bye. Good luck.